Jordan Maxwell is a preeminent researcher, independent scholar in the field of occult religious philosophy. He served for three and a half years as the religion editor of Truth Seeker magazine, which is America's oldest free thought journal. His work on the subject of secret societies, both ancient and modern, and their symbols has fascinated audiences around the world for decades. He has conducted dozens of seminars, hosted his own radio talk shows, appeared on more than 600 radio shows, and written, produced, and appeared in numerous television shows and documentaries. Much of his work is devoted to understanding ancient religions and their influence on world affairs today. I had an opportunity to meet Jordan about a month ago at the uh, L.A. Life Expo conference here in Los Angeles, and uh, we uh, hit it uh, hit it off, and I said, Jordan, send me a little more material about what you do, and he gave me his website, and you know what? Fascinating work. So he's our guest tonight on Coast to Coast AM. Hi, Jordan. How are you? Well, hello there, George. Always a pleasure. Delighted to be with you tonight. You have an extensive background in ancient mysteries and work. How did you get interested in this? You know, I don't even know. I just, as a child, I gravitated toward the, uh, for lack of a better term, the dark side of the world. <laughs> I always realized and felt in myself that there is a whole world of knowledge out there for me, but I just didn't know where to go to look for it because I just didn't buy, you know, what I see. I know there's more to life than what meets the eye. And so that's what really got me started as a child. And I uh, I grew up in, happily in a home where my parents, uh, um, especially my mother, continued to promote me to read books and study and question everything. And uh, I suppose it's just in my blood. I love the dark side. That, that, that happened to me in, in terms of not necessarily the dark side, but a family that really pushed me into reading books about the unknown and to go ahead and start doing my own homework and and start investigating on my own and at the age of 11, 12, 13 years old I started doing that. I think that helped my journalistic background. Oh, a lot. Yeah, without a doubt, you know, I, I started asking questions when I was like, you know, 8, 9, 10 years old and the adults would look at me like I was, like I was uh, a fool, but a classic example of a, of a child's question when I was being uh, uh, confirmed in the Catholic Church about nine, ten years old, whatever it was, mm -hmm. and we were told that the bishop would possibly ask uh, his, the children after the service was over uh, if they had any questions, and that we were told not to ask any questions, period. Well, that night after the, uh, the, the services were finished, uh, the bishop did ask. Uh, are there any questions from the children? And I stood up, scared to death, of course, because I knew I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked the bishop, I said, my father works with uh, torches. I mean, he's a welder. Um, could I take a torch and burn an angel? Would it hurt him if there was an angel here and I hit him with the torch? And, uh, and nobody said anything for a few moments. And then he said, well, of course not. And I said, why not? And he said, well, because you can't burn an angel. I mean, uh, fire is a natural thing. It takes a wood and, or paper or something to burn, but you can't burn an angel. And I said, why can't you burn an angel? And he said, well, because angels are spirits, and you can't burn a spirit. So I said, why am I worried about going to hell when my spirit will burn if you can't burn a spirit? And it was quiet all over the church, and I knew from that moment on... Um, there's more to the story than meets the eye on everything. Absolutely. What a great question for an eight or nine year old to ask. Well, oh, I'm just gosh. looking at the uh, the words and putting the words together, and and that's uh, what I've been doing all my life. You know, when you talk about your interest in the dark side, explain what that means. Yes, I do not mean that I am I am interested in the dark side to learn from it. I am interested to learn about it, meaning that there is always <clears throat> more to the story, as I said, that meets the eye on everything. And um, a classic example, if you're going to build on, on a foundation, say on a second floor, and you're going to put a lot of weight, like printing presses or whatever, the smart thing to do before you go starting to build on that foundation is to go downstairs, get on a ladder, 
and go through the ceiling tiles and look at the foundation of the floor. Look at the beams to see if the floor is going to hold that kind of mm. weight. Hmm. So what you're doing now is you are standing under the foundation to get understanding. Because that's where the word understand comes from. To go under the foundation to see what it's really based on. Good point, Jordan. A few years ago, uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, at the Hyatt, uh, they had a collapse of a uh, corridor. Oh, yeah. And uh, because they just had too many people standing on it, and I would guess their architectural studies, they did not factor in <laughs> a total amount of people that would be able to walk there on any given time. Definitely. And it collapsed, and it's exactly what you say. If you don't build that foundation first, the whole thing collapses. That's exactly right. I mean, if you're going to ship a package, for instance, uh, a big package, and you go out in the garage and you find some rope, and you tie the package up, well, the rope is probably going to be fine for the, for the shipping. But if you're going to take that same rope and hang it off of a 10-story building and put your life on it, and you're going to hang on it, now you better check the integrity of that rope. You better find out if it's going to hold you, because... <clears throat> as long as your neck's not around it, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because your decisions in life are only as good as your information. And this is what has bothered me from, you know, from as far back as I can remember, that there are always two kinds of facts, the kind you look up and the kind you make up. And too many people get in trouble then their lives are filled with trouble because they just haven't done their homework. They have been told by other people, and this is something I really don't like, is when other people, the word is project. When other people project on you what it is, what it is that they want you to believe, um, that is absolutely destructive to any person's uh, development. Um, you never know. You might have a small child who's a genius, who's questioning everything and, and might do something very big in life. But if you continue to put the child down and tell him not to ask questions, I mean, uh, who was it? It was uh, uh, the, the, I'm trying to remember his name, one of the scientists said that when he was uh, a child, he used to ask the teacher, why is it we children have to answer your questions but you don't have to answer ours <laughs> you know? so uh, my point being was a that, smart Alex scientist yeah. huh? <laughs> but uh, you know I'll, always keep in mind uh, as I have always I like this one quote I heard many years ago it says always trust the person looking for the truth don't ever trust the one who's found it the point being is that there is so much more to life than what we know. So many more facts that we're not privy to know. And even when you've got everything nailed down and all in a line, and then you find out ten years later that all, all the facts were wrong and now you start all over again. Because this is a continuing process on the earth. And this whole point that you brought up, the story that you brought up at the start of the hour about the uh, finding... The Iraqi culture. findings, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a one incredible story. There's a lot to that that a lot of people don't know. We can talk about that later. Absolutely. The, the, of course, one of the big stories over the last week or so in terms of box office appeal, Jordan, oh, is yeah. uh, Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. I haven't seen the movie yet. I like to wait a few weeks, let yeah. things die down, and then go and see it myself, and I'll me make too. up my own mind. Yeah, me too. It, but without, without getting involved with you now in the historical reference to what may or may not have happened, mm -hmm. I am particularly interested in the man and his powers that he may or may not have had. Did you ever look into that? Well, yes, but uh, there's a, just an awful lot of, of uh, area that we don't know for sure because we're, we're trusting uh, church officials to, uh, you know, to pass down to us the, the history, and we know all corporations uh, you know, lie on their paper, so we never know what for sure took place. But there is some valid research has been done in the first century. Um, and and I, I, I hesitate to talk about the movie also because I haven't seen it either. Mm -hmm. I don't believe, I, let me say it this way, I have the highest of admiration for the man and his work, uh, Mel Gibson. I have the highest of admiration for him. I do not believe he produced the movie to cause harm.
No. I no. believe, and it's just my my take on the thing, I believe that he produced it because he felt, as so many of us do, that our culture is racing uh, to uh, superiority in technology, but we're losing our spiritual uh, dynamics in our race. We're losing track of our spirituality, and so this was his way, I believe, of pointing up that there are more important things in the world than just making money and technology. Do you think we're running against a clock here, Jordan? In oh, I'm totally sure of it. You Absolutely. are? Absolutely, yeah. I, uh, I have no doubt in my mind about that, and uh, and it's getting awful late. Um, I don't, and I don't, you know, I don't even know where to start on that, but I do believe that there is a, a time in which mankind reaches... Um, a point of no return, so to speak. I think he's reached it many times in the past, and uh, I don't think ours is the only civilization uh, like us that is highly technical. I'm I'm totally sure that there were. You cannot look at the uh, the monolithic structures of the world all over the earth and not know that there were profoundly brilliant people. Uh, far, far back in time, and unfortunately, our religious and political establishment have uh, <clears throat> marginalized all of those things. And it's only until, like myself, you go to Egypt and go into the pyramids and go into the temples, do you really begin to appreciate the profoundness of these ancient people and what they were doing. Why do you think they marginalized this? I mean, what did they have to gain by doing that? Well, I think that its bottom line is control. And uh, you naturally, uh, <clears throat> if you want to control people, you must control what they know. Uh, you know, you don't want to have to run for, you don't want to run for mayor in a town filled with profound geniuses. And, uh, <laughs> they don't and need you, right? Superior people. Uh, you know, the more you can keep them occupied watching uh, basketball, the better off everybody's going to be. And so, I think that the religious system, especially the religious system. Uh, and I am, I have nothing against spirituality at all. I'm talking about the corporate uh, religious system that came out of Europe. Uh, we're talking about 2,000 years or 1,600 years at least of uh, the church dominating Europe and the Europe, of course, dominating the world. And there is a, um, an agenda which has been outlined uh, thousands of years ago. And well, it's still in operation today. With this agenda and with the, as you talked about, some of the incredible buildings that were left behind yeah. years ago, do you think they were made by societies who developed their own technology, or do you think they had some help from someone up there? I think they had help from somebody out there. That's just my subjective opinion, but I, I my gut feeling is uh, as brilliant as this creature we call man is, and it is an incredible creation, uh, we humans, but I don't think that we have the ability to do all the things that were done. Uh, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that we are not alone in the universe, and it always, it's always, George, amazed me to hear scientists and astronomers um, philosophizing in fields that they are not uh, prepared to talk about, but they talk about the fact that we obviously know that there's life out there, but they could never get here because the vast the distances of space are just too much. I think how absolutely ludicrous that is for an intelligent person to make a statement like that, when the fact is you don't know how far along these people or these uh, entities have progressed. You don't know what their evolution is. Precisely. They've been around for hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. I mean, these scientists are making reference based on the technology they understand today. Well, of course, yeah. but we, we were told that a man's body could not go the more, what was it, 25 miles an hour back in 1920s? Mm -hmm. We were told you couldn't go any more than that. Uh, uh, you know, 25 miles an hour, uh, the human body could not stand. Well, so much for that wisdom. And as I said, <laughs> things just keep changing. The more the more we change, the more we stay the same. You have a, uh, m ufology has also been a part of your entire big history time. now, hasn't it? Yes, very very big. I have always been interested. I was born and raised in Pensacola, Florida, and and right across the bay from me was um, was Gulf Breeze. Yeah, oh, that's right. And I grew up in Pensacola myself, and I don't know why me, but I grew up 
having all kinds of other world experiences. Uh, uh, I mean, there's, there's very difficult to try and explain it, but my whole life was filled with, uh, with strange things happening, seeing strange things that other people didn't see or having experiences uh, that other people couldn't relate to. And so I am totally sure there is something very legitimate going on in that area of Pensacola. Did you get going in your career? Did the, the, the Barney and Betty Hill case get you going as it did me? No, I, I really wasn't very well aware of that one. But my own personal experiences of what got me going. I mean, as a child, I would wake up. I, I put my bed purposely by my window so I could look up at the moon and the stars at night. <laughs> and, I would, and I'd lay there at night looking and thinking about what might be out there in space. And then I'd fall asleep. And I'm talking about 10, 12 years old. Yeah. And then I would wake up in the middle of the night, and, and I would see uh, someone at my window. Right, and I'm, my head's right there at the window. And they would be there looking at me. And, and when I'd wake up, I'd see them, but they would move instantly. But I saw them, but they would move. And I quickly, as a kid, you'd move very quick. I pop open the screen, and the, the yard is lit by the moon. There's no one there. But you're convinced someone was. Oh, yeah. I saw them. Yeah. So, and then, of course, I had, uh, I had some extraordinary experiences with spirit entities coming into my, into my bedroom. I, I woke up one night, maybe 9, 10 years old. I woke up one night absolutely uh, screaming my head off. I was totally ballistic. I was crying and yelling. Uh, because I knew that there was an entity in my bedroom, and it was extremely evil, and I knew it. And, and my mother, of course, screaming at that hour in the morning, two in the morning, everyone in the, in the neighborhood was hearing it, and um, my dad and mom kept trying to come into my room, but I was screaming and jumping up and down the bed crying, don't come in the room, he's here. You were trying to protect them? I was trying to protect them, and that's all I remember, is I wanted to my protect gosh. them from the entity that was in my room. And he finally, it finally went through the wall, and I felt him. I saw, I, I didn't see anything, but I felt the entity leave the room, and I knew where he left. I pointed to the wall, I said, he's just left. And, and I, then I fell on the bed, and I was totally exhausted. Um, so I've had these kind of experiences quite literally all of my life. So I am totally, positively sure that we are more than what we think we are. We, there's more to the human race than what meets the eye. No question about it. Let's talk about that boogeyman that you probably saw when we come right back, Jordan, because when you talk about the dark side... That's part of it, and I'd like to get more of your take on that and many other, many other things that we'll talk about uh, right here on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie with Jordan Maxwell, our guest tonight. Jordan, do you believe that that entity when you were a child was the boogeyman that so many children have reported seeing? Well... I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Uh, this was not... <clears throat> my experience was not with something that was a, a scary boogeyman. This was a very, very frightening experience. This uh, was worse than that, then? It was far worse than that. I was totally ballistic. I was screaming my head off, and I was frightened to death. I, I could not see what the entity looked like, but it was there. And, and a child that age does not go totally off the chart uh, that that bad for no reason and and when it left I felt it go out of the room and uh, so as far as I'm and I that was as I said that was not the only experience but that was one I will never forget and we talked a little bit about uh, the UFO yeah Two points I would like to make. First of all, i preface that by saying <clears throat> that I've done a lot of radio over the years myself. I've had my own radio show and been interviewed by many people. But you are an excellent host. I am very happy to be uh, on the show and talking with you because it's such a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, thanks. And um, in relation to the UFO, I've, I've been asked if you believe in UFOs. No, I don't believe in UFOs. I don't have to. I know they're here. I have to tell you a quick story that happened to Ivy, Ivy West, who you know. Yes. 
and myself and Paul Tice, who you'll have to know All right. later. Uh, I was, uh, this was back in 92, back in 1992, I was going to uh, be a, the best man at my friend's wedding up in Palmdale, which is about uh, 60 miles north of me. And I went up there to spend the day with him, and as we, everyone was getting ready for the wedding, uh, his uh, his wife-to-be went out with her mother and girlfriends to the market, and they came back, and there was an old man following them in the car, and he got out and followed them up to the house. And we wondered, who is this? And he came up, and the, and the girl said to me, she said, we met this man in the market, and he said he needs to talk to the uh, best man at my wedding. And she said, how do you know I'm getting married? He said, I just need to talk to the best man. And so she let him follow her home because he was an old man and didn't look uh, very dangerous. Suspicious, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I said, well, okay, talk to me. And he said, I, uh, I just have been told to tell you that you're going to be in a car and you're going to be driving the car yourself. And there's going to be a lady in the front seat and a man in the back seat. And you're going to be way out in the desert. And you're going to have a tremendous UFO confrontation. But it will not happen for at least a year and a half. It's going to be a year and a half from now. And I said, well, sometimes my friend uh, and I go up to, uh, you know, to the desert at night looking to see what we might see. And he said, no, no, this is going to be way out in the desert. And it's going to be east of California. And they are going to pick the time for you to see them. And so he said, but remember, a year and a half from now, and you'll be driving. Well, a year and a half from then, I was speaking at a conference, a UFO conference over in Mesquite, Nevada. And on the way back on Sunday, I had, I had Ivy in the front seat and Paul in the back seat. And we were talking, and I said, have you ever been up to Area 51? Well, no, none of us had. So I, we turned around and decided to go up. And we get up there, and we're sitting and talking with Joe and Pat Travis, uh, the lovely people who own the little alien up in Rachel, Nevada. Yes. And so we're sitting up there, and then when they're closing uh, that night, about 11 o'clock, 11.30, I said, Joe, where do we go to see UFOs? And he said, go out in the parking lot, they'll find you. And uh, but then so Pat says, well, if you want to go where all the tourists go, you go out on, on the highway and go back south toward Las Vegas, toward Vegas, back south, and go exactly 20 miles. And you'll see a big, big mailbox there. That's the famous black mailbox. And just sit there and wait and see what will happen. So we got in the car, and as we're driving out, Ivy's in the front seat, Paul's in the back. I'm driving. I got onto the highway and turned left, going north. Ivy didn't catch it. I didn't, or Paul. We went 20 miles north of Alien rather than south, and when we got to the 20-mile mark, we slowed down, put on the bright lights, looking for a mailbox, couldn't find one, so we decided to turn around and go back to the Alien. Mm -hmm. Well, as we stopped the car, right where we stopped the car, there was a, a road leading off out into the desert, a well-kept level road. And Ivy and Paul said, let's go out in the desert. And I said, well, you're out in the desert. You don't have to go any further. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go any further. <laughs> I don't want to go any further into the desert. And it was totally overcast. From sea to sea, totally overcast. Couldn't see a thing. And they wouldn't stop. They said, let's go out. So I did. We drove out a couple, three blocks. And then all of a sudden, I felt very strongly that we have done something wrong. I knew that we were in a wrong place at the wrong time. I backed the car up to turn it around, and I said, Ivy, I'm getting out of here. I'm scared. There's something wrong, and I don't know what it is, but I'm trusting my gut feeling. And Ivy and Paul jumped on me and said, look it, park the car. We get out for a couple of minutes. So I said, all right, but I don't feel good about this. They said, park the car. Get out for a couple of minutes. So I did. We could not have been out of the car more than one minute when the clouds just north of us, and remember, it's very dark on the desert at that hour, like about 1.30 in the morning, when it's totally overcast, no light, period. And uh, just north of us, the cloud began to open up, a hole in the cloud, and two beautiful, bluish-white, glowing, uh, disc-shaped, Thing oh came floating in, not zipping by, but slowly floating through the hole, coming, 
And as they came through the opening of the clouds, they leveled off so that their light reflected off of the clouds above them. And each one of them appeared about the size that the moon appears, the full moon mm -hmm. appears in the sky. So they were not little dots of light. These were beautiful, about the size of the moon, gorgeous, bl glowing blue and white uh, disks. As we, we, we were shocked when we saw these two discs come through, five more followed them. Now there were seven bluish-white discs hovering above us, making no sound whatsoever and scaring, my, and scaring me to death. Ivy and Paul are jumping around like they've seen Santa Claus for the first <laughs> time. They loved it. I was scared because I knew I have never seen anything like this. I, I'm from Pensacola. I know what the Naval Air Station has. Yeah, exactly. I've seen all the, the top of the line stuff. But this was not anything I have ever seen. And I was legitimately frightened. And I told Ivy, I said, w we're getting out of here, Ivy. I don't know what this means. I don't know who they are. And I'm scared. I want to get out of here. And so Ivy and Paul jumped in the car because they knew I was serious. They rolled the window down. I put my foot to the floor, flipped on the lights, and took off. When I did, Immediately, Ivy and Paul went totally ballistic, now themselves screaming at each other, and now they're scared big time. What are they scared about? And that's and I, and I kept screaming at Ivy because I am frightened. Ivy is now screaming, a woman screaming in your ear while you're driving fast. It's an extraordinary adventure. And so <laughs> Been I, there, done that. <laughs> yeah. And I, so I screamed at Ivy. I yelled at her. I said, Ivy, shut up. I'm trying to get out of here, and she's screaming, and so I stopped the car quickly and threw open the door, and the, those seven disc-shaped things were now down on us. Oh, they my were gosh. huge, and they were zipping around around the, uh, the car. They were doing extraordinary things of uh, coming together in a circle, blowing out into a seven-pointed star, coming back into a circle, blowing back out into a seven-pointed star, doing all kinds of extraordinary stuff. And it was, it, they weren't hurting us. They were frightening me. And now they've got the attention of Paul and Ivy, and they're scared. We got back out on the highway, and we stood there, and all the emotions started pouring out. There were tears. There were laughing. It was, it was beautiful. It was frightening. It was this and that. We went back to the motel, and for about an hour, you can imagine, the, 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 the conversation was, what in the world did we see tonight? made no sound whatsoever and did things that we have never seen any any craft do and later the next morning i got up and ivy and paul were over at the little alien having breakfast and i went over and i i saw a bunch of people sitting around the table listening to ivy and paul and i thought they were talking about what you know they were telling the people what happened yeah. to us last night no no, they were telling the people what happened to them in the bedroom last night that I slept through. And Paul and Ivy were visited. Or they let me sleep through it, obviously. But Paul was visited in the bedroom at the Lily Inn, and so was Ivy. One of these days you'll have to ask Ivy to tell you the story. It was an extraordinary story. That's uh, and and how does that tie in then to the old man who sent you on that merry way a year and a half before that? I know uh, he told me I would be in a desert, way out in the desert. He told me that there would be a, a woman and a man, and incidentally, he told me, and I asked him why, why uh, specific, and he said there has to be a woman and a man because there's going to it needs to be two witnesses. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to what you're going to see because the event is not for them it is for you but they want a man and a woman to be a witness to what you're going to see and there's a, there's a lot more to that story because it continued on once we got back to Los Angeles and I went back to San Diego and that's even a, a, an incredible follow up on the story we'll talk about another time but nonetheless I'm telling you this because I have personally seen some extraordinary and beautiful things that we refer to as UFOs. They made no sound whatsoever. They were right down over our car. They moved with the precision that I have never seen anything move with. They would stop, change places, and just stop and lock themselves in the air and not move, then zip, zip, and moving around again. 
uh, man, what an experience. Jordan, as you think about it now, do you think you had anything to worry about? Well, no, because uh, I, I, well, part of the experience is I went back out there. And I and I parked. A, a, it was a whole story, and I don't want to go into it. But I realized that if they if they meant us harm, we wouldn't even you wouldn't be here. Be talking here. About it. Yeah. Exactly. So I know that it was some kind of a contact, and obviously the man a year and a half before had been given that to tell me. And what a sight! Yeah. What a sight. What an experience. Too bad you didn't have the old camera and video camera know, with you. I know, but you know what? I don't think those things would happen if you if did. you had, because I think they're a lot smarter than that. <laughs> I think they tap into your mind. No doubt in my mind about that. Yeah, and I think that they know, they decide a lot of things. They will decide where they will meet you. They will decide what you will be doing and what you will have with you and what, you know, we've got to assume that these beings, whoever they are, are far, far superior to our intellect. I mean, they're like uh, giants and, and uh, brilliant people looking at children at play. Have you theorized why here, Jordan? Say it again? Have you theorized why they're here? Uh, yeah, I've got my feelings about it, but it's just a subjective theory. But um, I think that there's a very good possibility that they have always been here, that this is their... Uh, their earth, we probably are someone's experiment. Mm -hmm. And they have always been here. But they are far, far clever. I mean, it's, we do the same thing. You can have an ant colony on your desk in your office and just sitting and watching the ants uh, living their little lives and never realizing, looking through the glass, that, that there's a whole world out there watching you. Dropping a little food That's every right. once in a while. That's it. So I am I'm convinced from my own self that we not only have been visited, but we are living simultaneously with entities from other places, and I am totally sure of that. How, no has, doubt in my mind. how has that affected then, Jordan, the perception of various religions since the beginning of time? Oh, yes, that's the subject I love. Because once you get into the occult or hidden, and let me clarify the word occult, is a Latin word simply meaning hidden. And so much is hidden. And once you begin to see the paintings from the Middle Ages uh, and the, in the uh, temples and all of the ancient paintings, you begin to see UFOs and flying saucers everywhere. And, uh, and we're told there's nothing in Judaism or Christianity that in any way would conflict with the, with the idea of extraterrestrials. We talk about angels. The Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, talk about sons of God. Well, the sons of God are totally different than angels. Doesn't mean the same thing at all. That's and then true. There are, in the Old Testament, there's another entity called the Watchers. Well, this is in the Bible. This is this is Judaism of the Bible. This is Christianity talking about angels. And what's so fascinating, Jordan, is almost every culture talks about of extraterrestrials in their own little way. Absolutely. No doubt about it. If you'll remember, Abraham, uh, we're told in Genesis 18 that Abraham is sitting uh, by his tent and three men come walking up and he goes out and bows down, prostrates himself before them and bows down before them and says, what is my Lord saying to his servant? And they said that, that they were on their way to somewhere else and he said, the star, and the scripture in Gen uh, Genesis 18 says that uh, Abraham um, begged them to stay for dinner, and he had Sarah fix dinner for them. They sat and ate, and then the two of them got up and said they had to go, other business. But the third one stayed for a little while to talk with Abraham, and the Scripture says in the Bible, Genesis 18, that this was the Almighty God, the Creator Himself. And he sat with Abraham, had lunch, thanked him, got up, and then left. Now in Genesis 19, the two... Uh, men that uh, that he had entertained, we now find them in Sodom and Gomorrah, and now they're being called angels. And they go into Sodom and Gomorrah, they have supernatural powers, they, they cause blindness. Interesting, too. Sounds that, like radiation, doesn't it? Well, something, they had some kind of technology. And uh, what's interesting is that, that the homosexuals thought they were good-looking men. Now, the sons of God, as we know, the, there's, there's where is it in Genesis 6, 
where it said the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them all as wives well the point being is that I can understand uh, handsome good looking men talking women into the bed but I cannot see some hideous sun creature from another world uh, dazzling the females so they must have been good looking men well this is what the Bible says in Genesis 128 it says that God created man in his own image mm -hmm. after his own likeness now let's assume from how we're coming up to the top of the hour so we'll have to continue this but, uh -huh. but let me ask you this how many civilizations might be out there that are part of the same yeah goodness uh, I've heard uh, I've heard there's over 50 from government people who are in a position to know and uh, they've told me it's well over 50 uh, different ones that they know about and there have been a lot of other good researchers who are talking about the same thing but that's the ones we know about um, it's at least possible and, and and also this whole subject of the reptilian uh, that's another subject that I'm very interested in. I want to in. talk with you about that in in this reported 50 other extraterrestrials yeah, right. out there in the I know you can't give me your full um, sources there, but I want to find out what governments do know indeed about this whole thing. So uh, we'll be right back with you as we approach the top of the hour. Jordan Maxwell, investigative reporter, my guest. I'm George Norrie. I'll be back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie with investigator and researcher Jordan Maxwell. Jordan, tell me about these possible 50 alien civilizations that governments know about. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not really the person to talk about that. I have talked with uh, people in government. I have talked with uh, scientists who work with government. I've, I've heard many lectures uh, uh, by people who are, you know, more intimately involved mm -hmm. in that kind of research. And I I'm, I believe that what Stanton Friedman <clears throat> says, uh, my friend Stanton Friedman always says, that you cannot have it both ways. If someone tells you that they've had a confrontation with uh, extraterrestrials or UFOs or uh, reptilians, and you dismiss it as, a, as silly, if that same person were to go to the police department and swear out uh, that he has saw you commit a crime or he saw you eyewitness uh, kill someone, uh, that his testimony would be taken very seriously. And you would have uh, a difficult time trying to overcome an eyewitness testimony. So you can't have it both ways. If a normal person says that they have seen something, uh, you've got to look at that. You know, because, and you know, it's, it's very important. And, of course, uh, uh, like uh, Stanton Freeman also says, that uh, scientists will say, well, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Uh, and then Stanton says, well, okay, <clears throat> have you got a little piece of a black hole for me to examine? Because that's an extraordinary uh, story. <laughs> that's right. Have With you no... brought back a little piece of it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, e so exactly. Anyway. For so many years, Jordan, people who witnessed UFO reports were considered wackos or kooks. Yeah. Do you still think that so many pilots and police officers are subjected to those <laughs> feelings still? I think so. Yeah. I think so. But I'll tell you why I think that w is the case. I'll tell you why I think that the uh, people who would make such reports were always marginalized and put down. My, and this is again just my opinion, but I think that maybe the government has made a deal with these extraterrestrials, and the deal is you give us technology, uh, give us your sciences, the best that we can handle. And we will put down any reports. We will try and, and help you to stay incognito. We will protect you so that if anyone sees you, we will come out with our pontifications that, uh, that nothing happened. It was all a bunch of uh, swamp gas. And we will protect your presence here on the earth. 
uh, I am totally sure that's what's going on you know, from my viewpoint. Well, well, and you know, Dr. Michael Sala would, would back that as well uh, in his theories that this all started with Eisenhower working out some deal. I heard about that, and uh, Jackie Gleason and a lot of other yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. You, you said that reptilians, uh, that topic interests you. How come? Well, because I've had at least eight different people in different parts of the world, all of them very professional, well-grounded, intelligent people who did not know each other, uh, com you know, uh, confide in me long stories of uh, their personal involvement with extraterrestrial uh, or alien uh, hybrid creatures. And I have to say that there's too much smoke not to be a fire. I'm not going to discount eight different people who have given me eight different accounts, and mm -hmm. each one of them is very believable. Does that include David Icke? By any uh, no, as a matter of fact, it doesn't. Okay. No, not at all. Because he's a strong believer in this, you know. I know, and I've even said from a platform where he and I were both speaking at the same conference that I uh, was in total agreement with his feeling that they were here. However, not because David Icke said so, but because I have had personal conversations with people that I know to be very legitimate. And they're telling me the same thing. Are they but, saying that these reptilians have kind of made their way into the somewhat human race where they may be walking with us and we don't even know it? Well, if you'll remember back many years ago, uh, NBC created a, a mini series on television called V, and you can still read yeah, it. Yeah, sure. And it was about the reptilians who have the ability to shape shift and. And uh, there was a lot of interesting things said in that uh, miniseries. It was on NBC about shape-shifting reptilians. And they talked about the And, and I, I rented that television show, and it says at the very beginning, NBC said this is dedicated to all serious people who love their freedom and who love their country. This, this uh, movie was dedicated. I thought, wow, wait a minute. What, what is that all about? <laughs> so, what what uh, did they know that we didn't, huh? Yeah, there's always that possibility. Look, look in, in Northern Europe, there was an ancient uh, priesthood, uh, which we would refer to, I guess, as a white establishment of thousands of years ago in Northern Europe. It was called the Druids. The Druids had a very powerful political, religious, political uh, establishment. And one of the most important symbols in that Druid religion uh, was the magic wand, like Merlin the Magician yeah, with his yeah. magic wand. Okay. Well, magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly tree. They were made out of Hollywood. And consequently, today, we are still viewing the magic of Hollywood. Yes, we are. And uh, I, believe, <laughs> I believe that the, the word uh, magic is very legitimate and de jure. I think there is a real magic going on, and it has nothing to do with the development of, uh, of uh, the high tech from movies. I think that there is another kind of magic that's being worked on us by superior minds, and there's no doubt in my mind about that. And you may be right. What, what purpose, though, would that uh, be for? Well, I would think it would be for control again. Because we, are, as humans, are so individualistic and so destructive to ourselves and to our, and to our neighbors that uh, whoever is actually in charge, whoever that might be on the earth, they better watch the humans because you can never... Uh, say for sure what they're going to do. I mean, well, you, think you, you think you've got them all nailed down. They may do something you weren't <laughs> expecting. That's true, which kind of leads us into secret societies, Jordan, something yes. I have always, like you've been interested in reptilians, I've been always interested in secret societies, and you've, you've done some work in that arena as well. Yes. These societies go back since almost the beginning of mankind, don't they? Oh, without a doubt, absolutely. You can trace, this, uh, trace the concept of of people coming together for for their own just causes and not all secret societies are evil of course and i need to preface my comments uh, here by saying i have never presented myself ever as being the world's foremost authority on anything i'm too smart for that i am painfully well <laughs> you know aware just about of how much i yeah of how much i don't know so i'm not the world's foremost authority but i've been looking at this um, these kind of subjects for 43 years and 
Yes, the secret societies are a very powerful influence on the world today. There are things going on in the world today, politically and religiously, that would shock the normal person hearing it. And you can begin to pick up on, uh, there, is a, there is a whole system of symbols and emblems and words and terms, catchphrases, uh, flags, national coats of arms, presidential seals, corporate logos. All of this is a message. All of these uh, different symbols are messages. They're telling you something. And, uh, and symbols are very powerful, if you don't think so. Uh, wear an armband with a swastika on it and walk into your local synagogues and see the no, kind of response thank you. you will get. No, thank you. And you're right about that. You see somebody with, with a swastika on, which was an ancient symbol before, which, which was destroyed by Adolf Hitler yep. and his group of yep. cronies. Right. Uh, it, but you, you look at it now, and that's what you think about. Precisely. And that's the point. And therefore, symbols affect us spiritually spiritually, emotionally, and, uh, and, and we even use things like if you, you need some tape, we'll say, hand me the scotch tape. Well, it may not be a scotch company, but everybody thinks of it as scotch tape. Yes. Well, because words and terms and, and propaganda is continually bombarding us. They, but they did a great marketing job. Same with uh, tissue paper. You say, get me a Kleenex, that's right? That's it. Exactly. Yep. And so, consequently, I'm saying that we... Uh, in our world today, we have what is referred to as a consensus reality. The reality that we have all decided upon, uh, for better or for worse, we've all decided is true. And so it's a consensus reality. Well, I am of the opinion that, no, there's a lot more going on here that they haven't told you. Um, why is it that all birds, fish, and animals on the prairie why is it that birds and fish all immediately fly in a different direction together? What causes that phenomena? Uh, what causes people all of a sudden to grab onto something and everybody's doing it? The mm -hmm. hula hoop, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, the rap music. All of a sudden, same with, all over same the with earth. clothes. You know, you're out here in Los Angeles and you see this, uh, some woman by a fad outfit, yeah. and, and they've all got it. That's the point. I and mean, it's it, overnight. Yeah. And I have young people around me tell me, "Oh, I hear some, I hear some noise on the on the on the on the radio," and they tell me, "Oh, this is the biggest group in the world." I mean, they they made millions, and I'm thinking, "I've never heard this stuff before." And they, how long have they been out? They've been out for three weeks. Well, how could they be that big? Well, they are. Well, let's talk about the motivation for secret societies first yeah. of all, and without getting into specific names because you don't have proof over who they might of be. Course, of course. But you do have the ability to say what they might be, the kinds of people that are involved in these things, because I think it's bigger than governments. I think oh, it's yeah. bigger than elected officials. Um, and you know they're the, they're the uh, the puppet master of the puppets, and we're all the puppets here. Well, no doubt about that. What do they want first of all, Jordan? They've got more money than God, don't they? Well, yes. And if they don't, they can always print it. You know, they've got printing presses, <laughs> <laughs> legal printing presses, yeah, that's right? Right. That's right. And um, but I mean, what do they want? What's their motivation here? Well, again, I would is uh, again. I have to preface it by saying it's just a subjective opinion of mine, but. I think that these people whom we would say are the puppet masters are themselves puppets of a higher power. Oh, really? Yes. I am totally convinced for myself that the uh, some of the most uh, uh, hidden, powerful people in the world are themselves, uh, uh, you know, in subjection to higher authorities. And, uh, and how, how high might these other authorities well, go? Well, now we're talking about, is there something to this story of extraterrestrials inter, uh, intermingling with, uh, with the human family? Um, uh -huh. As a matter of fact, I, I have to tell you this. I, I watched a, um, an hour television show a few years back uh, on UFOs on one of the channels, and in it, uh, Gordon Cooper was uh, he had about two or three minutes here and there, probably about five minutes total out of mm -hmm. the whole hour, of Gordon Cooper making comments about his views on extraterrestrials right. and UFOs. And he spotted a few. Yeah. Yep. So I called the producer who I happen to know, and I asked him, I said, uh, how long was the interview? Because I know what they do. They'll, they'll, they'll tape you for two hours and use two minutes. Sure. And so I said, how long was that interview? And he said, oh, it's about an hour and a half at least. 
And I said, could you make me a copy of that whole interview? And he said, well, I'm not supposed to because it's... Uh, you got the outtakes, huh? Right. But I talked him into at least giving me a, a, a director's uh, cut so I could watch the whole interview. Well, what I am telling you is absolutely astounding. The things which... Um, which Gordon Cooper, he's a national hero. Former an astronaut, astronaut to, to some people who may be 15 years old or 20, and they don't know who he was. Well, he was an astronaut, and he was a very he was one of the first guys out there on the cutting edge. One of the seven. That's right, and uh, he is a brilliant guy and very, very smart man, and he had to be to be a, a, an astronaut. Well, on this interview, uh, <clears throat> they had, like, I guess, three cameras shoot, and so when he was on camera and there was being interviewed by this young girl, uh, it was a very, it was a very interesting interview. But what really got interesting is when it was off camera, when they would shut the cameras down and they were going to move the set around a little bit, one of the cameras kept rolling and they, they recorded the conversation between the, the hostess and, uh, Gordon Cooper off camera. Mm -hmm. And that's where it was interesting. And she asked him, and I still have a copy of this thing right here in my office. She asked him, what do you think about the idea of UFOs and extraterrestrials? And he said, I work with one. We have been working with him for some time. We found him in Mexico when he crashed. And our government went down and, uh, and uh, cordoned off the area where he crashed. We nursed him back to health. He's now with us in, uh, in uh, this country, and we've been working with him, and I've worked with him personally. So, oh and I God. thought, wow, man, put that on the air. Why didn't they put that on? No, no, thank you. No. And, um, you know, it was just startling to hear uh, Gordon Cooper say, no, no, I don't believe in uh, extraterrestrials. I work with one. Well, so, but do you think secret societies were set up because of this relationship or were they set up because of greed? I think they were probably set up by extraterrestrials. I think that they were probably ultimately set up by these uh, other world entities who the Bible says in Genesis looked like men. They were called sons of God. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important point. You need to understand there's a world of difference in the Bible between angels, sons of God, and the watchers. The sons of God, we are told over and over, looked like humans. They looked like men. They were able to procreate with females, which means their body operated like a human male. Right. So consequently, they could have children, they could have offspring, and they were, and as a matter of fact, I come across something a few years ago that still blows my mind. It's in the Old Testament in the book of Job 26. And Job 26, 5 says this. Uh, uh, keeping in mind, this is the Old Testament. It says, dead things, dead things are found from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. And the reference right across on the page it says, dead things are found from under the waters. The Eliaphas must be supplied thus this way. Quote, the place where the Repium stay, and the word is R-E-P-H-A-I-M, Repium. The place where the Repium stay, which is beneath the waters and the things that are living therein. This place answers to the other place, Sheol, or the grave. Then it says, the dead things, quote, is a Hebrew word, the repium, <clears throat> which is the offspring of fallen angels that are akin to the Nephilim, but are different. So we're talking about, in Job 26, 5, extraterrestrial or dead things which are living in the oceans. Well, now that opens up a whole new can of worms. Uh, about uh, Atlantis, and of course we know there was a pyramid found on the ocean floor Indeed. of the Atlantic. Uh, Dr. Ballantyne found that thing. It's the uh, uh, Miami Oceanographic Institute. Dr. Ballantyne found uh, flying over the uh, the Bahama Banks, 10 miles north of Bimini, found a pyramid sitting on the floor of the Atlantic. One would think it sank. Maybe it never did. Maybe it was always built on the bottom. Yeah, that's right. Maybe the water was in a different place uh, 100,000 years ago, you know. This could be. So the point being is that <clears throat> we have taken too many things for granted. And once you start really um, 
examining the words, the terms, the, the concepts, and where they come from, doing that kind of uh, research, you begin to see that there's a whole world of stuff that we've never been told. You... And I believe that this kind of knowledge is now finally coming into its own. It's taken a long time. I was talking about secret societies, fraternal orders, especially the Illuminati, back in 1967. Uh, I was giving lectures around Los Angeles. I was talking in 1963 and 64 about secret societies. Uh, so it's finally now coming into... Uh, well, you know, hold on. Full... Did you know Stanley Kubrick? <clears throat> no, I did not, but I have a, I have a feeling, and this, I can't prove this, but with his last movie, which he didn't get a chance to finish... Eyes, uh, Eyes Wide movie. Shut, right? Yes, that was a tremendous movie. All right, hold that thought, Jordan. I want to talk with you about that and some other secret societies and get a little bit more information on why you believe they are tied into extraterrestrials and why they want this control over us. Maybe, maybe they have to. Jordan, when I first watched Eyes Wide Shut, I didn't understand it. And then I did a little more homework into the Illuminati, watched the movie again, and it made a lot more sense to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I think, well, I, again, I'm just saying what I think. I think that, um, uh, what was his name again, the, uh, the, the producer? Uh, Stanley Kubrick? Yeah, Stanley Kubrick. Uh, Stanley Kubrick died before that movie was finished. My gut feeling is, can't prove it, but my gut feeling is, I think he uh, he was taken out because of that movie. Uh, I think he was trying to tell us something. Many of his movies were always very Promethean. They were yes. always telling you something. And I think that this movie, uh, he was getting up in years and he was an extraordinarily well-informed uh, man in Hollywood, and I think he was trying to tell the world something. And uh, I think he was probably, um, you know, probably taken out because of that. That's my feeling. And, and, and uh, Kubrick had a very difficult time with this movie. I think even in part of the uh, editing before he died, uh, it would it would on and on and on. And I think the movie uh, distributor company that financed it, they were getting pretty uh, yeah, unhappy yeah. over the length that was taking him to get this thing finished. Yeah, I heard I heard the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And then and then mysteriously he dies. Secret societies, though, they are out there. Is it a matter of necessity to have this kind of control over the population of the planet? Well, I think that there's never been, ever, a time on the Earth, and I mean ever, when the human family has ever been free. I don't think there's ever been a time in any place uh, in history where we humans have ever truly been free. And that's a big word, truly. You have to underline yeah. that. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, we talk about uh, America being the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, we're not free or brave. We're as free as I guess you can get. Yeah, huh? we're about as free as anybody's ever been. But we're not free. <clears throat> and uh, if you don't think so, wait till you get a, a knock on the door at 2 o'clock in the morning from the police department. Or you get a subpoena to court. Or, you know, why... <laughs> And that's the whole story too. I mean, uh, let me go back uh, to the to the movie about Mel Gibson just to make a comment. Here, All right. Uh, in relation to movies, uh, as I said, I had the highest respect for Mel and for his uh, purposes, and I think it was for a good reason that he was making the movie uh, a comment. But at the same time, I have worked with attorneys in New York for the Holocaust survivors, doing research for them mm -hmm. uh, on the Nazi connections in America and the banking connections around the world. I was happy to be able to do a little something to help them uh, in relation to the Holocaust survivors. So I appreciate uh, the, the Jewish concern because it's true. There is no doubt in my mind, <clears throat> anyone who knows history knows that religion uh, the and the <clears throat> shall we say the uh, zeal and the fervor which is which is whipped up by uh, the entertainment industry could very well uh, be 
bleed over into other areas that would be on uh, you know that would be unfortunate so i don't think that uh, that it's idly uh, it's an idle concern for the Jews to be concerned about the movie. I, I totally agree that uh, that too much persecution <clears throat> of the Jews in the Middle Ages uh, because of religious zeal gone gone wrong. And we know that's happening around the world today. We talk about uh, the fundamentalists. Well, my Lord, we have fundamentalists here. And so I think that it's well-founded, their concern. I don't have any problem with that. And as I said, I've worked with attorneys, uh, and so I'm intimately aware of some of the uh, -the behind-the-scenes research going on about the politics of of demonizing the Jew. And so I'm I'm very concerned about that. Again, I don't think that that's what uh, Mel was doing. So I think there's, uh, there's room for concern on both sides. And I would hope that America would, uh, would, uh, <clears throat> I would hope that we would be able to look past the, uh, the rhetoric that's going on on both sides and keep a cool head because I think there's, there's concern on both sides and I understand it. Now, the second thing I would like to, uh, address is, uh, the point that we talked about, uh, uh, ancient civilizations. In Genesis, the fourth chapter, it ta- it's a very interesting story about Cain killing his brother. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then it says in Genesis 4, 13, it says, and then when the, of course, when God saw what Cain had did, he, uh, he, you know, he called him out for it and said, what have you done? And Cain said to the Lord, and I'm reading this, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hit. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that finds me will slay me. And the Lord said unto Cain, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. So the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Well, wait a minute. <clears throat> if, if Adam and Eve were the first two, and then they have two sons, Cain and Abel, Cain kills uh, Abel. Who, yeah, who's left? Then who's left? <laughs> and, and, yeah, and Cain says, don't send me out there because they're going to get me. Who's they, right? <clears throat> Precisely. Who is they? Now, I talked for many years ago. I used to have a, a, a running conversation with a very high-ranking rabbi in America. I'm not going to mention his name because many people will know him. But we used to have long conversations, and I loved those hours. We would talk about theology, the Jewish perspective on things. And uh, he said to me once, he said, when you read the scripture, <clears throat> he pointed out in Genesis 9, Genesis 9, 1, it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. The rabbi brought, brought out that the word replenish is correct. Re means do it again. Obviously, if there's been a flood and people have uh, died, if you're going to, if the purpose of God is to have people on the earth, then you're going to have to, quote, replenish the earth. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense. However, as the rabbi brought out, go back to Genesis 1. 28, where the first male and female are being created by God, and it says, and God blessed them, this is Genesis 1:28, talking about Adam and Eve, and it says, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Like Do the, it like, again. Like there was something before them. Precisely. Now, what? Let's go back to Genesis 1 quickly to, to conclude this. Genesis 1:28. I mean, one Genesis 1, 2, the second scripture, says, oh, let's read it from the first. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. 2 says, And the earth was without form and void. That is not exactly what it says in the Hebrew. That We read it in the English, And the earth was without form and void. In point of fact, it is actually in Hebrew that uh, the earth became not was, but became a waste and a desolation. Something happened. Yes, precisely. And that word, tohuvohu, in Hebrew, which simply means became a desolation, 
is only used twice, once at Genesis 1-2 and once in Jeremiah 4. And in Jeremiah 4, it's interesting, it says, I beheld the earth, and this is uh, Jeremiah 4, 23. It says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. No, it became a waste and a desolation. And it says, And I beheld, and look, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens have fled. And I beheld, and look, the fruitful place was now a wilderness. And all of the cities thereof were now broken down at the presence of the Lord. Sounds, so, sounds like a nuclear holocaust, it Jordan. It sounds like something like that, that there were the cities that were there are now no longer there. It has become, it became a waste and a desolation. When might, might that have happened? Well, um, that's interesting. I, uh, you know, we know that there are seven, I think there's seven different areas in the... Uh, in the area of Israel, Lebanon, which are indentations in the earth that you can only see from, or you really only see it well from the from the plain, that are look like uh, uh, craters, and they found in those craters um, uh, a residue on the rocks, which they did not understand what this residue on the rocks in these craters were in the Middle East until after they uh, dropped the Hiroshima and Nagasaki mm -hmm. atomic bomb. Same kind of glass -like. Same kind of, uh, of uh, material. So from Zechariah Sitchin, and incidentally, I've sent Zechariah Sitchin around the world. I've had uh, contracts with him to produce his television shows that I wanted to do with him. So I've had a lot of opportunity to sit and, uh, and talk with Zechariah in private, and, uh, and I did an interview with him. You, you respect interview. him as a scholar? I, I, I love Zachariah Sitchin. He's a wonderful man. He's brilliant. But I will tell you this in public, one thing. There is far more to Zachariah Sitchin than meets the eye. Mm. The man is not just a brilliant scholar and a wonderful author, but he uh, there's just more to Zachariah than, than you know. That's another show. Yeah, that is another show. <laughs> so anyway, but the point being is that the earth became, and that's why... The rabbi said to me, the Bible does not say, and this, I guess this is the, the clincher point, <clears throat> the Bible does not say that God created man. Go back and read it correctly. It says, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he said to me, it's the way you're misreading it. Go back and read it correctly. It is What it is actually saying is that God is not creating man, uh, and then he read it to me this way. God said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness, uh, saying that come, let us make man in our image mm -hmm. after our likeness. Not the way he is. Let us make man to look like us. Which which sounds like a group of people or an yes. entity or Ours. something. Who? Who is us and our? Come let us make man. And now man has become as one of us. Do you think they were extraterrestrials? I, that's what I think. I totally believe Now, that. when do you think this, this uh, nuclear event, if that's what it was, occurred? Because a lot of people have said, even Michael Cremo, yes. that we have had past civilizations on this planet that might have been millions of years older than what we had thought. Perhaps billions. Perhaps with a B. Perhaps. Uh, I know the work of Michael Cremo, extraordinarily brilliant, brilliant author, and I am totally sure he's on to something. I think that, as we talked about at the very beginning of the program, you mentioned uh, that the scientists are finally dawning on them that there may have been some more ancient civilizations. Advanced. Advanced ancient civilizations. Well, of course. Yeah. Of course there are. Of course. And so... Uh, I, I'm, I'm just fascinated by how much we don't know. Well, be, because of this, though, let, 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 let me ask you an astrotheology question. Mm -hmm. The fact that all this might have occurred the way that uh, you've interpreted it and some others have as well, does not negate the fact that somewhere in this universe is that divine being, does oh, it? Heavens, no. As far as I'm concerned, let me, let me state uh, categorically. I am totally convinced that there is a divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I have no problem with that at all. That is one of my uh, major beliefs uh, I am totally convinced of, is that there is a God, so to speak. Uh, however, the word God 
uh, once you get into the the uh, you know the, the where the words came from and the concepts, but I don't have any problem whatsoever with believing that there is a divine presence in the universe that we call God. Uh, now, once we get past that, uh, now it gets interesting. You know, God is nothing more than the word than the than the, the word dog spelled backwards. This is why you have church dogma. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> why do you? Uh, what are we talking about now? The word God comes from the, a German word, Gott, G-O-T-T, -T, or Goth, giving us the word Gothic, or Gothic architecture, and Gothic cathedrals. Well, Gothic in uh, Scandinavia, in, uh, in uh, D Denmark, in that area, God is spelled G-U-T, gut. So therefore, if you've got a gut feeling, gut is a Scandinavian word for God. And in Hebrew, it's Yahweh, isn't yes, it? Yes, exactly. So consequently... When you start looking at, um, uh, it's fascinating how Hollywood interweaves all of these stories. The, the one subject after all of these years that I have finally settled on to be for myself the most interesting of all is uh, not the secret societies, not the UFO, but the religion of the Nazis. That is the thing that is still blowing me away today. Well, we got a few minutes. What do you mean by that, the religion the, of the, the Nazis? The planet Saturn, Saturn the planet, mm -hmm. was extremely important to the Nazis. Why? Now, once you understand Nazi theology, the religion of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, man, it opens up a world that you are not going to believe. When we talk about Saturn, Saturn was referred to as the Lord of the Rings. Women were told to listen to their Lord, and we make movies about Lord of the Rings. And inside the ring, in the first movie, I haven't seen the other two, but the first one shows runic writing. You better go back and look at that movie. It's talking about the planet Saturn. Uh, Saturn was the Lord of the Rings, as I said. Women were told to listen to their god, Saturn, so they would wear an ear ring. Men were to get married before their God, so they would wear a wedding and a mm -hmm. ring. Uh, the the kings were to get uh, crowned before Saturn, so they wear a round crown, becoming the corona later. Well, what's the significance of well, all this, though? Well, the Saturn is referred to as the inhibitor, the one who holds you back. He repre He's represented as the dark powers that hold you back and teach you lessons. Uh, consequently, Saturnalian symbols are like the mafia, like uh, the police, uh, government, the CIA. Uh, those are Saturnalian institutions in that they are very powerful, quiet, uh, sophisticated, and they are very, very powerful. And so that is a Saturnalian uh, symbols. Now, the planet Saturn... Uh, as is really seen everywhere the the planet uh, the color associated with the planet saturn is black and this is why when you go into courtrooms judges wear black robes uh catholic priests wear black robes i mean you uh, many times uh, young people graduating from university and college wear a black robe mm -hmm. black robes are represent the planet saturn saturn is the inhibitor he's the teacher uh, but now it connects directly to the Nazi movement, uh, and it's an extraordinary story. There are lots of, of uh, doctoral theses, reference works out there galore, explaining the connection between Saturn, the Nazi movement. Incidentally, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia, we have Mecca. Was this like, well, let's not bounce around too much here. Well, but, right, but in Mecca is the symbol for Saturn. Mecca represents the planet Saturn. Is this all part of the occult that you yes, were talking about? That's right. And, and so many people in, the, uh, in Saudi Arabia and Muslims around the world do not realize that the square, uh, the square of Mecca, uh, which is the most holy site in all of Islam, represents the planet Saturn. Why I know. Well, well, with all that said and done, so what? Well, so what are we talking about? There is an occult or hidden religion which dominates the occult world, which is dark and hidden. Uh, this is why you have Darth Vader wearing a black robe. You have Dracula wearing the black robe, mm -hmm. the black cape. Black has always been the symbol of that which is dark and, 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 and sinister. 
And so the, the, the color for the planet Saturn is black. Once you begin to do the research on the planet Saturn and its astrological uh, significance, and especially its significance of secret societies, the most important uh, secret society in Germany today is called the Brotherhood of Saturn, of the Saturnalian Brotherhood. Hmm. And it is a very powerful order in, the, in, the, in Germany and in Europe. So here's the question. Why Saturn, very quickly? Well, Saturn, uh, it's, it's um, you know, I don't even know that I can answer it in a quick All right, well, hold Saturn that thought then. Hold that thought, Jordan. We'll be right back with you. We'll take phone calls as well. We've still got another hour with you, so we'll be right back on Coast to Coast AM. So, Jordan, we know about the secret societies and the fact that they exist, but what's their mission with this control? Well, I, you know, that's, that's again, uh, a subjective opinion of mine. I, I think that probably whoever created us, uh, you know, I shouldn't be a bit surprised if we were someone else's experiment, and uh, they're naturally going to be concerned about what are we doing with this uh, earth that they have put us on, um, and they know that they have to have exercise some kind of control over us. Uh, we do the same with animals. We, we, and this is why humans are called cultures. You know, we, we have a different cultures. Well, a culture is something that's under a test tube that's being watched and uh, nurtured. So, um, I, I, that's just my opinion. But I think somebody else is in charge on this earth, and humans are not. And, uh, and therefore, some of the things that we're seeing happening is not, it doesn't make sense to us humans. Well, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with us humans. Somebody else is manipulating the human race to accomplish uh, hidden agendas. And, uh, I, you know, I, I've always believed that. Well, do you think the secret societies, uh, case in point, uh, the Illuminati, with memberships of uh, the, whomever may be there, do you think that these people are uh, alien uh, in in DNA, or do you think that they are human beings who have been given this task? Who, who do you think they are? Well, you know, if you remember that when the Illuminati, we're talking about the Bavarian Illuminati, because the original word Illuminati was uh, applied to the Jesuits. Jesuits were uh, the first time we ever encountered the word Illuminati were actually Jesuits of the right. Catholic Church. But now, but now what we're back basically talking about is the Bavarian Illuminati. And uh, I think that probably, um, because it's coming from Germany, it's coming from the Germans, uh, there is some kind of a, of a connection between the ancient Germanic peoples and uh, alien life forms from other worlds. I wouldn't be a bit surprised because this is what Adolf Hitler believed. This is what the Nazis believed, that uh, that they were in contact with uh, other world powers and other world entities. Well, what they accomplished in such a short period of time uh, and the kind of technology they have brought to the world uh, in Bill Corso's book talking about alien technology that we are now using I uh, I just suspect that maybe uh, there has been this collusion behind the scenes between uh, humans which are prepared to be able to uh, handle this task of of, uh, of dealing with extraterrestrials. Not all of us are. Well, they lost World War II. Something went awry. Yeah, well, uh, maybe, maybe there are others here who are on our side. Who knows? Well, that could be. Let's go to some yeah. phones. You ready? Yeah, sure. Let us go, first of all, to east of the Rockies. You are on Coast to Coast with Jordan Maxwell. Hi. Hi, this is Michael. I'm talking out of Chattanooga, Tennessee there, WGOW. Hi, Michael. Go ahead. Uh, I grew up in the Deep South, and when I was a child, I lived right across the street from what they call a clavern, which is for the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really fascinates me about Hollywood, how they portray the Ku Klux Klan as just a small group of people, you know, and it's really bigger than that, you know. Yeah. Uh, for instance, you don't know who who's a cuckoo luck and who's not, you know. And they're still around, and there's still, you know, quite a lot of them. Oh, I know. And yes. it's, it's not like Hollywood portrays it, you know. 
and they're a real secretive society. That's why they call them the Invisible Empire, you know. And in the South, the word they, or when you say they, you're talking about the Q Clubs, mm -hmm. because, you know, they're always watching. I would guess some of the membership doesn't even know who their other members are, right? Well, one, you know, they have different claverns. For, for instance, in one neighborhood, you might have a clavern there. And, you know, these you're taught from a young age, you know, to... Uh, to embrace, you know, their their beliefs, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, after the the racial trouble of the '60s, they all went underground. And but you know, they're still there, and a lot of them are politicians and prominent people, and you know, they're, that's what it means when it says invisible in Barry. You don't really know who's who. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just wondering, you know, with wizards and dragons, the Celtic connection there. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very important. Uh, you have you have something called the uh, Bohemian Grove. Uh, the very word "grove" is a tip-off. That's a that is a very powerful word. If you understand how the secret societies use that word "grove," uh, it's in the Bible. Grove worshippers, and um, that is a very Celtic Druidic uh, symbol. Grove. They meet in the grove, the Bohemian Grove. So yeah, there's there's a real story there. The uh, the societies. How many are there? There are many, or just a few. Uh, who are you talking? Who are you? You. Asking? you. I'm oh. not, not asking him. Oh, okay. I, I would say that there's well, there are, there are many different uh, various societies coming out of Northern Europe and out of Europe in general. Uh, but I'm talking about that particular group, what we call the Bohemian, uh, the Bohemian Society, Bohemian Grove. Right. I'm just saying that the word grove is a very interesting and important word in relation to secret society. But we hear about Illuminati, Bilderbergers, yeah. uh, and all these other different. Are they are they the same? Are the no, same people in there? I don't think they're the same, but I think that they have common cause. You know that. Ford Motor Company and General Motors are not the same, but they are all in, in the in the world of making cars and making money. So they obviously uh, are in tune with each other. So uh, I think that these different societies are in tune with each other. They have certain uh, uh, agendas that they're trying to accomplish together sometimes, sometimes uh, against each other. First time caller line, welcome to Coast to Coast. You're on with Jordan Maxwell. Hi there. Hello, this is Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I was sitting there listening to him, and he said that uh, he thinks that the uh, aliens is what set up the secret society. And, well, I just, I'm trying to, to figure out, I mean, why would they want to do that without no certain direction? I mean, he, you know, he just said that they have their own agendas from time to time. But, I mean, is there just their main goal, destruction of the Earth, or is it... Uh, to lead us to a better way because, I mean, uh, the way I look at it, if they were doing it for good, I mean, we wouldn't have the problems with the ozone layer or such things, you know what I'm saying? I mean, what's his opinion on uh, on uh, how they feel about us? Well, why do we, why do we humans also, uh, the higher-ups, the elders and the elites in our society and throughout the world, why do we collect ourselves into fraternal orders and societies and groups, uh, you know, which are opposed to other groups. So the idea and the concept of, of uh, collecting yourselves together seems to be an intelligent thing that, uh, that a, an elitist intellectual or spiritual elitist group would do. They're not going to hobnot around with us, the, the common people, so they would uh, naturally... Uh, Birds of a feather flock together, kind of thing. They would, they would uh, see more power by keeping to themselves, and we do that ourselves. Jordan, do the do the Hopi? I think they do. The Hopi Indians believe that we have been destroyed several times as as people. Well, you know that's interesting. Uh, I'm not really that well aware of the prophecies, etc., but I do know. That they that they are talking about the same kind of thing that there are star beings. They talk about the aliens from other worlds who have come here. Uh, how there has been world destruction on a massive scale in the past, and they're also talking about uh, you know, seeing their prophecies are coming true again. And yes, they do talk about. 
star star you know star beings and uh, and other worlds. Uh, so yeah, the the Hopis are very interesting. I, I'd like to know more about that. You know the uh, the tribe, uh, I, I, the Dogon tribe. Oh yes, um, over in uh, Mali. Yes, and, and they Mali. of course they have been told about the star system Sirius and Sirius. everything else. Uh, now here's something interesting. A lot of people believe okay extraterrestrials had to tell them because there's no way they would have known this information mm -hmm. with the naked eye yeah. um, what if there was a past civilization that had high technology and telescopes and things like that and that is what was passed down well all right <clears throat> and that's at least plausible however the 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 um, they were saying the Dogon peoples were saying that there were three stars uh, in, in, in line, and there's no way that we could know that from the Earth. They said that there was Sirius, the dog star, but behind Sirius there were two other stars. There were three in a row. And they said that the third one was the heaviest of all, in all of the creation of the universe, was the heaviest, was the third one. Well, from the Earth, there's no possible way we would have ever seen all three. Uh, so it, it implies that somebody from out there. Mm -hmm must have told them and that's what they're saying the Dogen tribes uh, uh, teachers say that they were told by extraterrestrials and if I'm not mistaken they say that uh, every seven years or so these extraterrestrials come back to Somalia and uh, and talk with and visit with the Dogen tribes I wouldn't be a bit surprised that's where we should be next if we could time it right let's yeah. go to our wild card line you're on coast to coast hi there Hey, George. Hey, Jordan. How are you all doing tonight? Fine. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, great great subject tonight. Uh, I have a question for your guest. Uh, going, going back to Hitler, uh, he was obsessed with the occult. It seems like a lot of his uh, henchmen were also. I have a question. He speaks uh, a few times about the new man and how he was afraid of the new man. It, 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 it worried him. He had met him. Uh, and I was wondering if you thought uh, that might be related to uh, Middle Earth, which he was obsessed about. Maybe the, uh, the new man was an alien or a reptilian from Middle Earth. All right, good. I, I appreciate that, that, uh, that question. Uh, I was going to say the same thing, uh, that I also am very, very concerned. That's one of my chief concerns and worries today, not for my own safety, but for the general uh, uh, safety of the human family. I am also very concerned about what is called the new man. That's simply N-E-W-M-A-N. You uh, do some research on the new man. Adolf Hitler believed that the sons of God, these aliens, he, he said, were preparing the human family to evolve into a higher race of entities, and that's what his uh, Gestapo and his whole apparatus was set up to do: is to be the, uh, the be the instruments by which the human race could be cleansed of uh, undesirables and and uh, the eugenics of uh, crossbreeding uh, people with higher with higher uh, entities. Uh, it's called the new man, and I think that that is something that's very legitimate and might very well be going on today. And they make movies like uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau with uh, with uh, Merlin mm -hmm. Brando. These kind of movies have been made for many years in Hollywood about mad scientists cross-breeding humans with animals. I've heard this story from many, many places. Wouldn't it be uh, amazing that... Uh, Hitler's quest for power and his mental imbalance was based on the fact that he may have believed or may have been given information about an extraterrestrial race wanting something. Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a wonderful book that you can't find there right now anywhere called The uh, Morning of the Magicians by two French occultists who wrote this book and is translated into English, and I have it called Morning of the Magicians, in which they talk about Hitler's uh, uh, concentrating on trying to communicate with the alien life forms from other worlds to uh, recreate man and call him the new man, the new creature that's going to take over the world. And this new man will not have any emotions. He will not have any 
uh, spiritual longings. He will be a corporate mentality. All he will know is what the uh, what the corporation and the government tells him, and he will have no. Uh, there will be no problem with him doing whatever his masters tell him to do. He will be the new man, and uh, and this is why I agree that the Jews do have a legitimate concern about. Uh, this whole subject of the reinstituting of Nazism in the world today. I am telling you, it is happening. We are seeing the re-emergence uh, of the Nazi world philosophy coming into being in this world. And I am frightened, and I believe that the Jews have a right to be frightened and concerned. And I think all Americans have a right to be concerned about this uh, very possible happening to us. Wild card line, welcome to Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I love your show. This Thanks. is Vernita from Jackson, Mississippi. Hi, Vernita. And my question is, um, are aliens evil? Are they from God, and what is their purpose? I didn't hear the, the question. Are they evil? Are they from God? What's their purpose? Aliens. Well, um, oh, angels. Well, uh, Alien. I... Aliens. aliens. Oh, aliens. I'm sorry, aliens. Well... Uh, aliens, I guess, would be just uh, entities from other planets and other places in the universe. And there are a lot of uh, uh, scientists and, and astronomers uh, talking openly about the fact that we're not uh, alone in the universe. And maybe their form of, uh, of evolution, they have evolved into spirit entities. Maybe they were created spirit entities. Um, doesn't mean they're good or bad. It just means that there are other kinds of life forms out there, and maybe they're coming here. Jordan, right before the hour break, uh, we didn't have enough time for you to finish your answer on Saturn. And when, when I meant to, to say to you uh, of this so-called Saturn connection, so what? The so what was really why the importance of Saturn in their thought. Well, <clears throat> again, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big story. All I would say is that for anyone interested in that, it's a lot of information out there, uh, a lot of good books. All you have to do is go on the web and just put in the occult significance of Saturn, and you will begin to see that the, the uniforms that the Nazis uh, were wearing, their insignias were Saturnalian. Saturn was, uh, was a very important uh, in the ancient religions. Uh, in the ancient religions of the Middle East, Saturn was a very powerful uh, symbol and a very powerful god. They, was it an evil or negative symbol? Uh, yes, it was, in point of fact. It was a negative and, uh, for a lack of a better term, evil. It, it always pictured the god Saturn always, uh, of course, in the Roman Empire was one thing, but I'm talking about the ancient ancient world of the Middle East. Saturn was the inhibitor, the dark side of the force. Darth Vader, uh, the courtroom, the judge, uh, it always symbolized the undercurrent of political or occult power over the world. And, How uh, strange that this gets carried through to society, yeah. and, and in some cases we don't even know about that unless we yeah. chat with someone like you. You know, we take these things for for mental uh, gratitude of, uh, you know, people walking around in robes that are black. You never would think about the reason for it. Yeah, I know, I know. So, as a matter of fact, Saturn was referred to as L, and anybody who would uh, promote the worship of Saturn became known as an elder. This is where we get our concept of the L leaps. Uh, why? Because, <laughs> yeah, because it goes back to L, and... And how did you get to be an L elite? Well, you got L elected. That's why you have L elections. <laughs> and uh, you know, and and consequently, how do you get L elected? Well, you got to have the juice. It's called L electricity. Uh, there is a uh, there is a whole world of interesting connections between words and the planet Saturn and the ancient religions and secret societies. And I'll be right back in just a moment. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Nori with Jordan Maxwell, my guest, and your phone calls for this remaining half hour. Jordan, where do your travels take you next? Well, I think I'm going to be going to Egypt, uh, England, uh, Australia, and, uh, and Switzerland. 
and uh, all of a sudden got busy again. Are uh, you uh, are you seeking uh, something on these missions? No, no, not being invited to speak in different conferences and, and places. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be speaking up in uh, Santa Clara uh, very soon at the UFO. Uh, I think it's called the Bay Area UFO Conference. That's in September, and of course, I'm also speaking at the uh, Conspiracy Con. That's a big one up in Santa Clara. You can go on my website and check it out, Conspiracy Con, and uh, that's going to be in Northern California. JordanMaxwell.com, by right, the way. JordanMaxwell.com. You are not related to any coffee empire. I right? don't think so, no. <laughs> You've got that perfect name, though. Uh, well, thank you. You really do. Ready for some more calls? Uh, yes, and before we do that, I'd like to give out a phone number for those who sure. might want to call anytime, 24 hours a day. Uh, for whatever reason, it's a toll-free number, 888-212-5400. 888-212-5400. Simple enough. Right. Okay. Let's go to our wild card line. You are on Coast to Coast with Jordan Maxwell. Hi there. Hi there. Um, I had a question I'm hoping that George can um, help me out with. I've been dealing with this for 10 years. <laughs> That um, situation you were talking about that scared the heck out of you when you were a child, mm -hmm. you are the first person I have ever heard say that. And I had a similar incident, um, and I was just wide awake. I don't remember anything before. I couldn't move. Um, I knew that they were at the foot of my bed. I couldn't see them. My husband continued to sleep he, like he was not even aware mm -hmm. and I was so terrified that if I could have crawled into his skin I would have mm -hmm. um, it was so horrifying that when I could I got out of the bed and I remember writing the entire thing down um, thinking it was a dream and uh, although believe me it didn't feel like it yeah. the strange bizarre thing that scared me even worse is the next time it happened um, again, I went to write it down, and when I looked back at the previous log, it was exactly a month apart, exactly within the day and the hour of the first incident. Mm -hmm. And I threw the book away that I was writing in, and I just was, like, very upset. And all I remember during those two instances was begging God to make them go away. And I, would, I guess my question is, um, was that a dream, or does that sound like anything you've ever heard of before? Well, I or hear, is it like I, yours? I hear these kind of experiences uh, all the time. Also, one of the nice things that uh, a part about what I do is I'm I'm in the company of other researchers and writers and and people who are on the cutting edge, and I hear these kind of stories all over the world. This is what makes me believe that there is too much smoke not to be a fire. I think that there are other life forms here, and some of them are extremely evil. Some of them <clears throat> may be very uh, helpful to us. Uh, they're not all bad. They're not all good. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on this subject, but I have had too many experiences and been in the company of too many people who are experts in their own field, and I am sure that there is something to this. I know what I felt and experienced. So you don't think it was um, a dream or anything? No. Because the funny thing is, is <clears throat> I know that there's no way to explain this. I know. It was almost like a pal palatable uh, sense of an absence of time. Not that I was missing or anything, but time stood still. Or yeah, I know. Does that make yeah, any sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and, yeah. and it was like they were evil, and I, you were the, the first person I've ever heard, and I've never told anyone this because I thought they'd think I was crazy. Yeah. So well, you're saying that they were beings? Yeah, I think so. I think that ultimately that's what we will decide and what we're going to find out is that not all living entities and all living things have to be physical. I think that the Bible is correct when it talks about angels or, or spirits. I, as, as George brought out, uh, every culture in the world has talked about spirits and angels and entities and my goodness, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that these entities exist. And it's not, <clears throat> it's not the kind of a subject that you can do justice to, uh, you know, on, you know with, with the time restraints we have. But I have heard too many people having similar experiences. Yes, it's real. 
All right, thanks for that call. Appreciate it. Let's go to our east of the Rockies. And wow, the clock ticks fast when yeah, you're on, Jordan, doesn't it? It certainly does. East of the Rockies, welcome to Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hi, George, Tom, Lafayette, Indiana, Hi, Tom. WIBC tonight. Welcome to the program. Uh, yeah, um, on the uh, Saturn thing, uh, Hitler kind of drew from a lot of different mythologies and kind of screwed them up, but uh, in the uh, Teutonic mythologies, Saturn wasn't all that significant. It was the moon of Saturn that was significant, because in the mythology... The Titans were rescued by Earth from their daddy and put on a moon of Saturn. And then when Mom got in trouble with the uh, gods and whatnot, the Titans rode their moon over and then attacked the gods. Mm -hmm. And by the mythology, that's why the Christianized mythologies always consider the moon and Saturn evil. But it basically, it's supposedly the moon that circles our planet now was originally from Saturn. Yeah. And it's the Titan moon. Hmm. And uh, the, Teut the Teutonic Knights originally weren't even Christian, and they weren't they weren't uh, Luciferian. They were the defenders of Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, from their point of view, the gods were bad. The children of Mother Earth were I mean, the children of the gods were bad, and they're just defending their pl their planet from alien invaders. Well, I'm very well aware of the work of David Talbot and uh, the Cronia Communication Group of Cronia. Uh, they have done a lot of work on, on Saturn and its uh, significance in the ancient world, its symbology, etc. And, and David has done a, a lot of work, and his name was uh, David Talbot. And, uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. You know, it's funny, today uh, the astronomers have got a report on Saturn's rings, Jordan, mm -hmm. with some strange anomalies that they can't figure out. Um, I think it's more physics-related than paranormal, but it's still strange that we get that story today as you talk about Saturn. Yeah, well, you know, uh, what was his name? Norman Berglund, uh, who wrote Ring Make Ring Maker? I think so. Saturn? Yeah. And I met him, a delightful gentleman, and, and we talked for hours on this subject up in San Francisco area where he's talking about it. He worked with NASA, and he was, he's got pictures of one of the rings that's being formed right now. It's not, it's not completed. And, and it's his uh, feeling that the rings are artificial. Someone's putting them there purposely for a reason. That's very interesting. He's got a book out which my company will have to uh, carry because I love that subject. You have videos, but do you have any books out? Oh, yeah, yes. I've got uh, some uh, books. As a matter of fact, if you go on my web, um, uh, there's about four or five of them right there on the web. And, of course, you can go on uh, uh, Google and, and hit uh, Jordan Maxwell, and you'll see all of my books. But I've got them all myself, and it's on jordanmaxwell.com. Good for and you. if you are interested, again, uh, the uh, the toll-free number is 888-212. That's 888-212-5400. And that phone number is uh, on the website as well? Yes, it is. And it's 24 hours, and we'll try and get back to you and go on the web and check out all the materials that I've got and things. that, And give me a call and leave a message. I'll get back to you. Let's go to our first time caller line. Welcome to Coast to Coast. And Jordan Maxwell here with us as your guest. Hi there. Hi there. Um, my name is Jeremy, and I'm calling from Palmdale. Hi, Jeremy. I, hi. I just wanted to say, uh, Jordan, hi. And uh, we met back at uh, Paul's um, probably in 96 when he was still staying down in Burbank. And uh, it's good to see that you're still keeping up on your research. Oh, thank you. Um, but I have two questions. The first is um, about the Nazi religion. How much of it do you think that Hitler took from Madame Blavatsky's work um, the Hidden Doctrine, where she described the Aryan race as the oldest and most pure, and the Jewish race as the newest and least, in her opinion. And uh, second, are your older videos still available through thebooktree.com, or are you handling all that now from your website? Yeah, I'm handling all of my own materials uh, through my website, jordanmaxwell.com. Uh, I've got all of my old materials, and we call them the classics. I I'm working on a lot of new things now for television and for distribution. Uh, but, yeah, you can get all of the old things, too. It's all on my website. And, yes, I do believe that Hitler was uh, uh, heavily influenced by the writings of Helena Blavatsky. I have all of her works, too. 
I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very interested in the uh, in Blavatsky's work because she pops up uh, many different places. A lot of people don't know about the uh, influence that Helena Blavatsky had on the Nazis. So, yeah, there is something to that too. Uh, even JPL today uh, was called when it was founded Jack Parsons Lab. That's where, and it was uh, Jack L. Parsons and Alice to Crowley from England, the great magician from England, mm -hmm. Alice to Crowley, and uh, L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology. Mm -hmm. L. Ron Hubbard, Alice to Crowley, and Jack L. Parsons came together and formed what we today call JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab. So, yes, there is a very heavy connection with the occult world and space flight. I did not know that. Uh, yeah. I did not a, know that at all. Yeah, there's a very interesting story about uh, uh, the connection between space flight. Now, I mean, go back to NASA, N-A-S-A, and check the word. And uh, it goes back to Jesus being a Nazarene, NASA, N-A-Z-A. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bring me some... <laughs> I mean, this stuff really gets interesting when you start breaking down the words. Jesus could not have been from Nazareth because there was no Nazareth in the first century. But he could very well have been a Nazarene. Look up the word. Look, go to a dictionary and look up the word Nazarite or Nazarene. It's spelled N-A-Z-A-R-I-T-E. Look it up and see what it says in the dictionary about Nazarite or Nazarene. And you find out that N-A-S-A... And N A Z I are all connected to NASA or NASA or Nazarene. And um, there's a world of, of information about our space. Fascinating. Um, you would have been a fun professor to have in college. Oh, I love all kinds of strange stuff. Let's That's go. That's what I love doing. Go to our wild card line. You're on coast to coast. Hi there. Hello. Yeah. Hi, uh, George. Mom. My name is just Julie, Julia. Excuse me. Hi, Julia. Yes, hi. I'm from San Diego. And I was originally from St. Louis. So, um, anyway, I love your show, and I've spent many a night glued to your show in my driveway because I can't get out of my car. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I've wanted to call many times, so it's really cool to be on. Oh, thanks. Go ahead. And um, I wanted to mention, uh, you, you've asked callers to call in when they've had otherworldly experiences, and there's been a lot of times I've thought of calling in or, or I've tried and haven't gotten through. But I wanted to kind of bounce this off Jordan, and I never have fully figured out why I've had so many experiences, but um, it started, and I won't say a whole, like, in-depth stories right now. Yeah, we don't have to. No, oh, I, I don't want to do that anyway. My point I'm wanting to make is... Um, that when I was young, like 12 years old, like Jordan was mentioning when he was really young, I started seeing um, spiritual beings, and uh, totally unexpectedly, the first one was, at, it was very strange, but half of a cat walking, and I made the big mistake of yelling and telling my mother, who thought I was insane, she was very conservative. But anyway, then um, I had a few dabblings in the Ouija board, which I found out real soon was totally Stay evil. away from the Ouija board. Yeah, oh yeah, I already, I believe me, I found that I, I, everything it said was, was negative and a lie. So I quit doing that. But then somehow I ended up continuing to connect with spirits, um, with spiritual beings. And it was to the point that I would even, like at the YMCA in St. Louis when I was only 12 and 13 years old, I'd bring groups of kids down in the basement when it was totally dark and I'd ask spirits to show themselves and a lot of times it would be like large skulls or d d different spiritual beings. Sometimes I'd bring individual friends in their closets and they would change their identities from Indian to this or that, different things. And well, as I said before, all of these, all of us, many of us, uh, far too more, more people than you would suspect have had all of these kind of experiences. And again, I'm just saying there's too much smoke not to be a fire, that there's definitely something going on uh, right in front of us that many of us are experiencing, and I believe it's coming, it's coming to a head. I think that uh, eventually there's going to be uh, some kind of a world 
uh, event that's going to uh, cause us to look for the first time at the possibility that we have been uh, we've been manipulated from day one, and then our history on the earth goes back millions of years, and there's a world of knowledge that's been hidden from us, and this is what I have been involving myself in for 43 years, and uh, yes, I've heard all kinds of stories. You know, a lifelong quest, call. Jordan, a lifelong quest to get yeah, to the bottom. No doubt about thank that. Thank you. Let's give you that toll-free number out one more time, would you? Thank you. Yes, it's one eight eight eight. Two one two five four hundred. Very good. For Jordan, you want to look at some of the books and some of the things that he's talked about tonight. Also, if you do have a computer, jordanmaxwell.com. It's linked up with coasttocoastam.com. Jordan, we've got to do this again. Thanks for the stories, Thank by the way. Thank you very much Fascinating for Fascinating talking with you. Bye-bye. For Dan Galanti, Steve Carr, Tom Dan Heiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Barbara Simpson, and Art Bell, I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. I'll see you on our next edition as we talk about the Coral Castle and try to figure out how Ed Lead Skullnan moved those huge blocks of stone, much like the Egyptians. Did they move those blocks of stones of the pyramids? We'll find out with our guest Joe Bullard, his book, Waiting for Agnes. And you'll have no idea who Agnes is until you listen to the program. Until then, be safe, everyone.